It was 2006, and a man named Spencer had decided to go and spend his entire day fishing in one of his all-time favorite spots, the Muskinet Kong River in New Jersey. So he woke up that day feeling quite excited about the upcoming adventure, and so he calls his boss, who is one of his close friends, and invited him to join him. Now. This particular river isn't really long by any means. I mean, we're talking about roughly 45 miles running through the northwestern portion of New Jersey. However, these 45 miles trek through incredibly beautiful and scenic territory, and they really kind of do a good job straying away from the urban concrete jungles many of us are accustomed to. And instead, they offer a dive into the beautiful forested areas of the state. Now, it was at this very river where our story unfolds. You see, both Spencer and his boss arrive excited about the fish they might catch, and they took their time setting up their fishing gear and just positioning themselves roughly 50 yards apart on the shoreline. Now, during this time, nothing out of the ordinary was taking place. It was just a regular day. And so Spencer calls out to his boss, confidently declaring that he was going for the big one and would likely outdo his boss. And so he cast his line into the water, and then he immediately notices that the current below is extremely strong and fast. And within seconds, he feels this very strong tug on his line. Now, unsure whether it was just a fish or possibly the tension from the water, he was determined to catch something very big. And so he leans back using all his strength to pull it in. And he notices that his line was now being pulled harder and farther than what be than what would be considered normal. Now he's struggling to gain ground and he's doing his best to dig into the gravel of the riverbank, pulling with all his might. But then something catches his attention out of the corner of his left eye. So he looks over and what does he see? He notices a strange shape to his left. Now at first he wasn't exactly sure what it was, but as his brain tried to make more sense of what it was he was seeing, he was realizing that things didn't really align with reality. And as he focused on this entity and understood that it wasn't a human being, nor was it a fish or any known animal that he was aware of, he would understand that this wasn't something that naturally belonged in the water or on land. His gaze was drawn to its thigh area, which was incredibly large, and he observed it moving up and away from the riverbank, distancing itself from him and then his boss. And then, voila! Spencer's brain struggled to process what it was he was looking at, the best way he could describe it was a large, gigantic creature resembling a praying mantis. It had the triangular shaped head, enormous creepy slanted black eyes that moved back and forth, each with a surprisingly expressive look, and it was clear that this creature was just as surprised to be noticed as Spencer was to see it, despite appearing all thin and gangly and very tall it seemed to possess immense physical power in its body. And what was even more disturbing was its apparent intelligence. Understand that this all happened very swiftly, so the creature then retreated into the underbrush before his boss could ever catch a glimpse of what Spencer had seen. And you could only imagine how awestruck Spencer must have been during and after witnessing what it was that he saw. In fact, everything happened so fast and he was so taken aback by it that he never ended up telling his boss about the incident even when the day came to an end. However, years after, he would later recount his experience to the famous Albert Rosales, who was most known for maintaining an exceptionally large database of encounters with humanoids. Now, as a matter of fact, folks, this isn't the first time something bizarre like this has happened. For whatever reason, fishermen seem to experience a lot of strange occurrences. Now, it's not entirely clear why, but perhaps it's because they immerse themselves in nature, making themselves completely vulnerable to the surrounding elements. Now, whatever the reason may be, the large mantis humanoid of New Jersey that Spencer witnessed remains a mystery. In fact, this next story is very similar to what Spencer had experienced. Now, 
Clyde was around 14 years old when his experience occurred. Only three weeks prior, he had moved to eastern Tennessee, settling into the same neighborhood where his grandmother had lived. Now, Clyde was relatively close to his grandmother and had visited the area several times before, so he knew pretty well what to expect. Now, for those who have never been to Tennessee, it's a beautiful oasis with lush, thick forest, a stark and beautiful change from the Pacific Northwest. Now, for Clyde, one of his favorite features in the area was this large pond or small lake situated in the middle of an adjoining neighborhood. In fact, it was located on a property owned by a friend of his father. Now, it's important to note that in addition to this small lake, the area also featured a gazebo that jetted out slightly over the water, and there was also a dam responsible for creating the lake. And on the far side, the dam would drop down roughly about 50 or so feet into the woods. And so it was late on a Friday night in January in the dead of winter when Clyde had the bright idea to visit his favorite fishing hole early the following morning. Now, anyone excited about fishing knows it can get tough to get some shut-eye the night before. And so young Clyde tossed and turned, turning all night, just unable to shake the thoughts of reaching the fishing spot early and catching some good fish. I mean, he was practically itching to get there. And so finally, the clock struck 1.30 in the morning, and Clyde decided it was time for him to grab his gear and head out. Now, for most of us, 1.30 might seem exceptionally early for a 14-year-old boy to venture out alone, but his excitement was understandable. I mean, after all, fishing was his thing. Now, besides his gear, Clyde left with his most trustworthy partner, Angel. Now, this was a dog that was a mix of a rat terrier and a Jack Russell, and truly his guardian angel and best friend. And at eight years old, Angel had already bonded with Clyde to such an immeasurable degree that they were practically inseparable. So Clyde and Angel would make their way towards the pond in the middle of the night with the surrounding neighborhood completely and eerily quiet. Now, fortunately, the pond was relatively close, but they still had another half mile to walk to the opposite side, which they then completed. Now, after a short while, Angel and Clyde finally reached the gazebo and settled into a nook between two benches. Clyde pulls out his thermos and began sipping on his hot cocoa while the air and lake around them were completely and utterly still. The moon was almost full, casting a luminous glow, and fog was now rolling in. Now, folks, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this is the perfect setup for a horror movie. And with what's about to happen, well, you could say that. Having already spent considerable amounts of time getting to the spot and setting things up, Clyde then sprang into action, casting his line into the water. Now, it's important to note here that Clyde's fishing rod was equipped with a very specific setting that would emit a loud clicking noise if the line was nibbled on. Now, this feature allowed him to keep his hands in his jacket to try and stay warm. I mean, it was at least in the 20s this night. And this also enabled him to sit back and be alone in his thoughts, which he did do. Now, for almost an entire hour, there was nothing. So Clyde just sat there with Angel, taking in the cold night around him and enjoying the beautiful scenery. And, you know, he would occasionally look around and especially towards the dam on his right. And it was right around this time that he began to notice something out of the ordinary, something moving. Now, what Clyde saw was what he initially mistook for a large white dog, and he observed it walking on all fours, seemingly sniffing the ground. Now, with Angel by his side, he didn't really want any confrontation, so he picks up Angel's leash and keeps a very close eye on the dog in case it happened to move in their direction. Now, as he continued to watch, he would notice the creature approach the wall of the dam and then do something completely abnormal it would stand up on two legs. Now, this sudden, unnatural movement made Clyde duck down to the gazebo floor, holding Angel close to ensure her safety. And after a few seconds, he would lift his head, now completely freaked out by what he was witnessing. All he knew in that moment was fear, and he desperately hoped the creature wouldn't come towards the gazebo. Well, fortunately, it hadn't noticed him. 
at least not yet. Now, as he watched, this thing effortlessly leapt, or as he would describe, glided to the top of the dam, which was roughly about eight or so feet from the ground. And this is right when it happened. This thing turned its face in his general direction. Now, this is when Clyde got a really good look at whatever this creature was, but keep in mind, even though it looked in his direction, it hadn't noticed him yet. He was looking at roughly a three and a half feet tall animal of some kind and noted that it had very long skinny legs and arms and a wide oval shaped head with large eyes and a large mouth. Clyde could even make out many small teeth and would appear to have huge yellowish orange eyes. Oh, and of course, it was still glowing at this point. Now, for many, this immediately brings to mind the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins, which happens to be a very famous UFO case dating back to 1955. And the more I think about it, it's actually not that far away from Kentucky. Now, if you're like Clyde, which I'm like Clyde, I would have been crapping my pants. I mean, he was nearly hyperventilating, going into a full-blown panic attack, doing his best to control his breathing, and he was praying this thing wouldn't hear him or see him. Now, as if things could not get any worse, Angel was now aware of this thing's presence, and he could see the hair on her neck stand and her hackles start to raise as she starts to growl, and struggling to get out of his arms to get to this thing to protect her master. Now, what's weird is that Angel seemed at the ready to go and duke it out for her master, but Clyde remained completely frozen. He stayed crouched in place and just continuously was looking at this thing over and over. And now this went on for several minutes, and he would not turn his eyes away for any reason from this thing. And similarly, this being, whatever it was, never moved at all either, except occasionally looking down at its hands as if it was holding onto something, but Clyde couldn't see or make out what. Now, as time would drift on, Clyde knew he needed to do something. He needed to make an escape, and he couldn't for the life of him think how he was going to do it and get by without being seen. He devised a plan that they would creep away and hopefully not get caught. So he reaches over, grabs Angel, and pulls her tightly into his coat and shields her eyes from this thing. Now, at this point, he slowly manages to stand, and just as he did this, of course, he hears a loud clicking noise. Quickly reacting, he looks and sees that his rod, out of all the times which has been sitting idle this entire time, has now, for whatever reason, caught a fish and is rapidly clicking away. Cursing his luck, Clyde lets go of Angel, who, for the first time, actually now sees this creature fully while the creature is standing on the dam, and this thing is also now scouring the area because it too hears the clicking sound below. And so Angel begins to go crazy, barking and acting maniacal as dogs do, but I want to make a note here that Angel wasn't barking out of confrontation, but was barking out of complete and utter terror as she feared for her and Clyde's safety. And now with their cover completely blown, this creature had now pinpointed their location and it began to do something that Clyde would have never imagined. It slowly crouched down, almost as if getting ready to run or leap in their direction. However, it did something completely unexpected. It made the most horrendous loud shrieking noise that Clyde had ever heard before. Now, Clyde would describe it as a woman, but screaming backwards. And so this creature then turned around to jump into the opposite side of the dam where the concrete would actually merge into the forced floor. And once that happened, it had completely faded, as if it had just simply blinked out of existence and was no more. In the haze and chaos of the situation, Clyde was now hysterical and in tears and managed to run for his life. Angel was now fully grabbed in his arms and he was daring to never look back over his shoulder. Now, once he made it back to his house, he locked everything up, crawls into bed, and just sits there stirring on what had just happened to him. And once the adrenaline finally exited his body, he was finally able to crash. Now, what's interesting about Clyde's story is that he had apparently completely forgotten what had happened to him until sometime the following day. 
almost like some sort of bizarre trauma response. Clyde had even tried to convince himself that the entire experience was just some sort of weird dream until he had to go collect all of his fishing gear, which he had left at the gazebo from the night prior. Clyde would eventually tell his mother what he saw and experienced, and to his astonishment, she actually believed him, but could offer really no insight or explanation as to what he had experienced. Now, the entity that Clyde saw that morning remains a complete mystery. Our next story takes us all the way back to 1986, all the way into Arizona. A woman and a stay-at-home mom by the name of Jenny was so disturbed by her own encounter that she refused to talk about it until 14 years after the experience had happened. So quickly, we need to set the stage real quick. Jenny's husband was the kind of person who was often away out of town for business trips for long stretches of time. And so since her son's father wasn't there, she wanted to do her best to provide activities that usually takes place between a father and son. Now, this would include fishing, which kudos to her because she had absolutely zero experience with fishing and she still wanted to give her son an absolutely amazing experience, determined to provide him with a very fulfilling childhood. So she would go to the store and ask around to find out what sort of fishing equipment she would need. And after purchasing all of this gear herself, including rods and reels to extra fishing line and hooks and even a tackle box, she would set home to surprise her son. And so soon, on a sunny afternoon came when Jenny and her son set out for a fishing trip not too far at a lake right near Tucson. Now, it's important to note that as they arrived, there was nobody else in the area. They were completely isolated and alone. So they began to unload everything and set things up. And they had not yet baited the hooks. So even though Jenny was completely revolted by pulling out worms and baiting them and pushing them and pulling on them to get them on the hook, she did it anyway. Now, here's where things start getting complicated. She's struggling and struggling to make things work. Because her son was very young, he really did struggle to cast the line far enough away from shore. And even when he managed to do so, the worms continuously kept falling off the hook. And so Jenny began growing more and more frustrated as she's trying to make this happen and securely attach the worms. And they just kept wriggling off before any fish could even have the chance to bite them. And so she's helping her son, desperate to give him a great fishing experience, and something happens. Out of nowhere, this young man appears and calmly asks her what's wrong. Jenny, of course, was a little surprised to see him because it's a sudden presence, but seeing his calm and warming demeanor, she explains in her frustration that she couldn't get this whole fishing thing down. And so he begins calmly offering bits of advice and even showed her son how he would always tie the worm in a knot right around the hook to secure the bait in place. Now he steps in and even showed her son how to cast and within moments began catching their own fish. Now whoever this stranger was, was extremely kind and generous. In fact, he would even stay the entire afternoon continuously helping her son and giving him more and more pointers. Now, Jenny was so surprised at his good nature and well-being that she would even extend the invitation to have an early dinner picnic with him along the shores of the lake. He, of course, accepted and enjoyed dinner with them. Wanting to make a memory of their beautiful fishing trip together, Jenny snaps a photograph of the man and her son together before the man kindly parts ways with the son and Jenny. After saying their goodbyes, Jenny and her son decide to go wrap things up and, like the stranger, decides to head on home. Well, a couple of dates go by and something very strange happens. Jenny decides to finally go and get the pictures that she had taken developed. And now, as she begins going through the snapshots, she found herself on the very bizarre photograph. Indeed, it was the picture of the man posing alongside her child. Now, something that she realized is that this was a weekday and whoever this man was had sacrificed or at least neglected either one of his days off or had skipped work entirely to provide his fishing mentorship to her son. And so Jenny began thinking back on it and she recalled through the experience that he had mentioned his occupation multiple times when just pressed through casual conversation. And so she figured that she would track him down because of his goodwill and offer him the photograph as a token of gratitude. So she quickly grabs the phone book, scouring through. Aha! She finds the place, she dials the number, she calls, 
because she knew she had found it. And this is when things get really crazy. Once she reaches hold of the fellow employee on the other end and she begins asking for this man, the employee on the other end of the phone goes silent. Now, I want you to remember real quick that she never got his name, only his physical description. So the best she could do was to call this place and begin to describe what he looked like and that she was actually looking to talk to him. Now, after a brief and awkward pause, the employee on the other end sounded visibly distressed and began telling Jenny that she had just named and described his brother who had drowned in the very same lake five years ago, in the exact same lake that Jenny and her son just fished at. Of course, Jenny was flabbergasted at this news and completely stunned. And she was so confused that all she could do was manage to make an awkward response before the two of them would hang up the phone call. Now, I can imagine that employee was probably thinking that this was some sort of prank call, and I guess I can't blame them. Now, that must have been pretty heavy for her to sit with. Now, shortly thereafter, she needed to get down to the bottom of this. So she attempted to do some research at a library and found out that this gentleman had actually drowned that day as reported by in some local newspapers. But guys, the story does not end here. It gets crazier. Check this out. So now Jenny starts thinking, okay, well, if that really is his brother on the other end of the phone, he's going to want proof that this really happened. So she actually takes the photograph of her son, puts it in an envelope and tries to mail it out but it comes back several days later unopened. So thinking, okay, what do I do? She would finally put the picture in the envelope in a drawer and then it would somehow magically appear back on her desk of all places. Things were getting really strange. Now thinking by this point that she had more than enough of the experience, she began ripping up the picture into pieces and then would burn it. And wouldn't you know, thinking that that was the end, the following day, the picture had completely manifested itself fully intact back on top of her desk. Now, at this point, she is at a complete loss of how this can logically happen. None of this makes sense. Now, this is feeling like something out of a Hollywood thriller movie. She gets in the car, drives herself out back to the lake where she had initially encountered the stranger beforehand, and she gets out of her car and begins begging to the stranger as if he is right there next to her to please go into the light and find rest. You could imagine she probably felt a little silly just yelling out to the air because she really had no idea what she was doing, and of course, she was desperate for answers and a resolve. Now, after that, she took a sigh of relief and decided to go get in her car and drive home. Now, she believes that this was the end of that now and everything could finally be okay. So she gets home that night and it's a pretty normal one. And so she decides to go crash out at a normal time and all of a sudden, the phone goes off and it's three in the morning. Now, immediately, Jenny is filled with anxiety because again, her husband was away on one of his work trips and was not here. So she assumed that it was him calling her with a dire emergency, you know, the dreaded ones, the worst ones possible. And so she frantically picks up the phone and she's surprised to hear who was on the other end. You guys can see where this is going. She did not hear her husband on the other end, but all it was is static. And so she's listening and she could hear something very faint through all the static and she manages to make out a very faint thank you right before it hangs up and the dial tone had returned. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't see how anybody could fall asleep after that one. Now, as the days wore on, it was as if this man had never existed in the first place. The photograph she had could now not be found anywhere as if it had simply never existed. In terms of what Jenny experienced and who she had encountered that day while helping her son fish remains a mystery. Now, let's make our way all across the pond to Ireland, specifically right off the coast. It was an early morning in July when a worker aboard a fishing vessel in the Irish Sea was trying his best to keep himself awake. It was roughly around three in the morning, so he was already exhausted, and he noticed something out of the ordinary. You see, the seagulls around here would normally be following his boat, and they were nowhere near quiet. They would cause so much commotion and tremendous racket, but all of a sudden, they had gone completely silent and the air had gone still. Now he thought this was very odd and out of place, so he begins glancing around trying to find the source of this sudden silence and didn't notice anything out of place. 
And now he's confused because he can't find any reason for this sudden silence. And so he's looking around and the deck through the window appears to be completely devoid of anything out of the ordinary. And there was nothing to be seen to the rear window of the wheelhouse. However, ladies and gentlemen, he began to look off to the side and noticed what it was. It's what he would describe as a strange humanoid figure that was keeping pace with the fishing vessel, only it wasn't swimming in the water, it was flying in the air, roughly about eight or so feet right above the sea with its back to the sky. So now he's completely terrorized by what he's looking at because he's not even sure what he's looking at. And so quickly thinking, he runs over and fastens the door to the wheelhouse and then runs over and shouts down to the ship, frantically looking for all the other crew members to come up and see what he's seeing. Before anybody else could see this creature, it had increased its speed quick enough to now soar towards the boat and face the vessel head on. Now, even though it was dark out because of the time of day, there wasn't a whole lot of light due to the conditions it had fully revealed itself in. It was in the dim red, green, and white lights of the boat that a face could now be seen, and it appeared to look like a gray alien almost. Large black almond eyes, but the head appeared more round than oval, and it almost levitated or floated right towards the wheelhouse until it was roughly about five or so feet away, giving the witness an even better look, unfortunately for him. And now because it was so close, this person could actually see an expression on its face which he claimed it appeared sad. Now the skin appeared to be this sickly gray or white color, and even stranger is that whatever this figure was, appeared to be wearing a kind of robe of some kind or had some sort of black hood over its head. Now the entire sighting lasted around a minute and a half, and unfortunately, none of the other crew members on board were able to reach the wheelhouse in time. Now, it might be a pretty long time for a sighting like this, but very short for trying to rouse exhausted fishermen out of their bunks. Now, soon enough, the figure vanished back off into the black sky, and all that was left was darkness. As far as what this Irish fisherman saw that early morning in July out at sea, it too remains a mystery. Now, for this final story, we need to travel very far, right off the coast of Queensland, Australia specifically Mowbray, which sits in the north end of Queensland. Now, something to note is that this is a very scenic destination and is very popular among swimmers and outdoorsmen. Now, on this particular day, a fisherman by the name of Steve had decided to head up to Black Rock Waterfalls, which happens to sit right in this very area. Steve's plan was simple. It was to hike towards his favorite fishing hole alongside his beloved family. Now, the trail he planned to hike actually leads for nearly two miles until reaching the waterfalls, climbing its way through dense foliage and forestry. Now, this area is pretty wild and there really isn't even much of a trail. The trail is really just having to walk along the banks of the creek and you kind of have to hop from rock to rock sometimes. But it gets even more wild. Sometimes you might even have to wade through chest deep water like Steve and his family had to. But, I mean, if you're adventurous enough, it shouldn't be too big of a deal, right? Well, it didn't take long before Steve's family just kind of left him in the dust, but not intentionally. They were just excited at the prospect of actually swimming, while Steve, on the other hand, decided to just take his time. He was just in awe of his surroundings and just taking everything in, really enjoying the adventure and the journey. And very soon, folks, he would find himself completely refreshed in nature. And after traversing some, there was some light rain that had set in. And of course, Steve and his family eventually made their way to the waterfall. And due to where the area was, Steve wasn't too hopeful about catching a lot of perch because they would typically look for prey further down the creek. But he was more in it for the actual experience rather than how much he could catch he simply decided to just relax and just enjoy the sounds of water. Now, unfortunately, guys, we know how these stories go. His peace was very short-lived. As he's sitting there enjoying the serene beauty around him, he begins getting this feeling that something or someone is watching him and now begins to feel very nervous and anxious because this is very abnormal. And so he does his best to brush off the feelings and after a while, begins making his way down the creek. 
Now, unfortunately, this feeling did not subside and it wasn't overwhelmingly powerful, so he just did his best to ignore it. But his gut instinct wouldn't let him forget, and eventually, he would make his way all the way back downstream, but would continue to stop at the various pools of water where he just assumed fish might be biting. And after trying and trying, he had no luck. And so roughly, after about a thousand or so feet back down from the main waterfall, is when he decided to sit down and switch out the lure on his fishing pole. Now, it was right after this that the feeling of being watched suddenly escalated to crippling levels. Suddenly, Steve began to smell this horrible odor that he would compare to a foul-smelling sweat or rotting fruit or flesh along with a wet dog odor. It was so incredibly overwhelming that it was more like experiencing an odor rather than simply smelling it. And that's from Steve's mouth himself. Now, almost instantly after smelling this, he became very confused and lightheaded and would almost describe this trance-like state. Now, this feeling would only last for about four to five seconds, but recalls that he actually lost track of time during the short trance. And the next thing he recalls is that he had suddenly snapped out of it whilst looking down at his rod, and that the instant he snapped back into reality, he would describe all the hairs on the back of his neck standing on end. And he begins to describe this tingling sensation that would shoot up his back and neck. And it was as if his entire being was screaming, you need to get out of here now, danger, danger. He had never in his life experienced something so profound as this. It was so primal and instinctive that all he could feel was doom and that he would not live if he stayed there longer. And deep down, he knew instantly that whatever had caused him the sensation did not want him there, and he could not stand being there any longer. So Steve, recognizing that this was possibly some sort of demonic entity of some kind, apologized out loud for being there and quickly made his way back. That walk back was probably the most painful and paranoid one he's ever done. The entire time he's looking over his shoulder as if something was just going to jump out and pray and eat him. He could feel prying eyes on him the entire way. And now on the way back, he could have sworn on at least two or three occasions that he had heard a scream or a screech of some kind, but couldn't be too sure. You know, with the waterfall and the loud gushing of water and all in the background, it made it hard to tell exactly. Now, as he would make his way closer back to where he came, the feeling would begin to subside more. He finally made his way close enough that at this point, he was roughly three quarters of the way back to the car and somehow was feeling brave and had enough courage and curiosity to see if maybe he could or should communicate with whatever this was. So he stops and begins to turn around and go back in the way he just came upstream when this feeling of what he would describe as intense doom hits him like a ton of bricks. It was simply as if whatever it was that was watching him was giving him a firm warning, don't you dare come back here. It was here that Steve pretty much just accepts defeat and makes his way back to the car as quickly as possible. And as he's making his way, he notices that the owner who actually lives in the adjacent property right near the entrance of the trail had actually just brought out his equipment down to mow his lawn. So Steve then decides to try and catch up for some quick chat and just during their small talk, they would eventually ask if anybody else around there had experienced anything out of the ordinary while hanging out upstream. Now this guy's reaction wasn't normal. He stops looking at Steve, then glances around to see if anybody else was listening and then looked at him dead in the face and said, you aren't the only one to have an experience out here like that. He began to inform Steve that roughly about five times a year, he would see people walking down from the falls with this expression of pure shock and terror on their face that Steve was now plainly wearing himself. And as a matter of fact, one of the more recent ones, roughly a year prior, this couple had actually come down and described a scenario nearly identical to Steve's. And then this man began listing off all of these things that he had noticed and assumed that it had something to do with the wet season because there were fewer tourists during these months. He mentioned how he too had heard these unsettling screams coming from the deeper parts of the forest and would describe them being similar to a pig but would never find any sign of disturbance. 
He also described how there were mornings where he would hear the birds calling to each other incessantly, seeming very startled and worried, and then would just suddenly go quiet. Now, the man then explained to Steve that this particular area has had a lot of Yowie sightings in the past. What's also interesting is that this particular area has been known as a sacred birthing place for women by an indigenous Australian elder. So is it possible that this has anything at all to do with what Steve experienced? Well, it's hard to say. As far as what Steve experienced and the entity that made him feel what he did, well, it's a complete mystery. And because you guys have made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, gone fishing, so I know who made it to the end. And if you guys enjoy this kind of content, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more just like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next video.